man and woman that goes to war anywhere would learn to claim those promises and put God first, I can guarantee you on the word of the living God, they can come back without a scratch. Last week we talked about Hebrews 11 and what faith is and how awesome people uh, can do things by faith. And the Lord says in His Word, in, in fact in uh, uh, Matthew uh, 17, He says that, I think it's Matthew 17, 20 or 21, Jesus said, if we have faith, nothing shall be impossible with us. Is that what He said? Yeah. If Jesus said, if we have faith, nothing shall be impossible with us. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. In other words, Lord, why could we not heal this little boy? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, is that a pretty awesome statement from the king? Now see, if we walk in faith, you don't have to worry about keeping food at home. If you walk in faith like he walked in faith, he took a couple of fish and a couple of little loaves of bread and fed thousands, didn't he? And then had multitudes of baskets full of scraps left over. So there's no limit if you learn to walk in faith. You don't have to do any of this stuff if you can learn to walk in faith. But I don't know anybody knows how to do that. I hardly ever see anybody that can walk in real faith. You know that? You know, I mean, we're, we're programmed to walk in sense knowledge faith. Do you know what sense knowledge faith is? That, that's right. That's exactly right. The flesh, you have to see it. You know, I, I believe it because I see it. Yeah, I, I, I believe, you know, that this building is here because I see this building is here. Now then, if you were somewhere else and I told you, I said, well, I've got a church out there. And you say, oh, you do? Yeah, I've got a nice little church out here. It's out here between Justin and Argyle. And you say, you really have a church? Yes, I have a church. Now, you have to believe that by revelation from me. Because you ain't been here and seen it yet. You know, once you see it, then it's no big deal. You know it's there for sure, don't you? But you had to believe by revelation faith to start off with. And most people today in a church will say, I don't believe that. That's just like I had a man yesterday at the healing school and his daughter, his whole family was here, his mother, everything. But his daughter brought five of her friends. She goes to Ramah in Tulsa, Broken Arrow. And so when I was in Tulsa the other day, she heard about it because she's been listening to me for a long time. And her and her dad both, all the whole family. And she brought five of her friends from Ramah over to my teaching. And within the first 30 minutes, I made a statement, you know, that because of these promises, you know, God promised in His Word, if we obey Him, to take all sickness away from us. So since He said that if He takes, He'd take all sickness away from us if we obey, then if we're sick, that means we've got to have sin in our life and we're not obeying. Three of them got them walked out. I mean, that's what God's Word clearly said. And then uh, 30 minutes later, I made a statement like that again. I said, you know, one thing about it, Sickness is caused by sin. When we don't obey God, it clearly says right here that if we do not obey Him, He will afflict us and our children with all these diseases. And two more of them got it marked out. And so anyway, five of them in, within the first hour got it marked out. And when she talked to them later, they said, you know, he's crazy. He's absolutely crazy. He said, sin don't cause sickness. You know that's not the way it is. I just read it out of the book. I mean, I just read it. But, so you see what happens when people, they have an, a mindset of what they think God is like. And they've been taught in church what they think God is like. And then when you show them from the Word that they're wrong. This is what they do <laughs> instead of this. <laughs> you know what I mean, right, young lady? They don't want to believe it. When you tell them God will do something and you can show it to them in the Word where He said it, they say, I don't believe that. God's not like that. He would never do that. But He will. If He wrote it in that book, you better believe it's going to happen, right? So, by believing this, let me show you some things as we go into the faith chapter. We're going, we got down to verse 4, 
in uh, uh, chapter uh, 12, but uh, I want to go back and start with verse 1 of chapter 12, and I want to show you, because there's some very important things in the first couple of verses of chapter 12, we, let, and we'll use the NLT. Let's go to uh, Hebrews 12, uh, 1, and it says, Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, we, we just remember, we've been talking about this huge crowd of faith people that God's talking about. Chapter, chapter 11 is called the faith chapter of the book of Hebrews. And so it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, in other words, the Bible is full, of, especially chapter 11, is, is full of men and women that walked in faith. And God did awesome things with those men and women that walked in faith. Well, I think that they shouldn't be the only ones that get to walk in this. I think the rest of us should be able to walk in this too, don't you? Amen. Yeah, because it's not just for them, it's for us. And so, since I've learned that and had the privilege to walk in it to a degree, I, I think everybody needs to know what I know about Jesus, because I want them to walk in faith. And it says, we are surrounded by this huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Because of this, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. What kind of weights can you have on you that slows you down? What kind of weights? What, what is a weight? It's sin. Any kind of a sin, I mean, I don't care what, you, what kind of a weight you have on you, but you know, I, I just want to, who, who, can, who can name for me a weight you consider is something that you're dragging along with you every day as a Christian that's slowing you down to, in this walk with God? Unbelief. Unbelief. Oh my goodness. Yes, that's definitely a big one. Unbelief's a big one. Anybody have anything else? Lack of knowledge of the Word. We don't spend enough time. Where God told us to study to show yourself approved unto God, didn't he, Bill? And so, as businessmen, we get too busy. We ain't got time to spend hours every day with God's Word. So, we might spend, uh, maybe we we'll go to church on Sunday if we got time, right? Do you know men like that? Yeah. Oh, not, but not no more with you. <laughs> You're learning the truth now, right, Bill? Yeah, that's the reason you're sitting there. You know, can anybody else think of another sin? Unforgiveness. What? Unforgiveness. Oh, my goodness gracious, alive. That is a big one that Lou just said. Unforgiveness. Oh, my goodness. And how many people, how many people do you know in church that if I, I yesterday I was talking about walking up to somebody and slap them in the face, you know, bam, <laughs> like that. And they said, mmm, 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 you know, I mean, first of all, the Word of God says, if I offend you, how many times are you supposed to forgive me? 490. Oh, my goodness, God, <laughs> 490 times. I mean, but how many people do you know that could do that? I don't guess I know anybody that could do that. I mean, I mean, whenever... So I might walk up and say, hmm, Kim, I don't like your dress today. <laughs> now, that, I should never say that, but if I did that, Betty, might she take an offense? Oh, how, how dare the pastor talk to me like that? <laughs> I, I use you as an example because I know you ain't going there. <laughs> but how many people do you know that would? I mean, they wouldn't even think about forgiving me one time, much less 490 times, right? So, I mean, if I told you every Sunday, I don't, I think you look lousy, you know. <laughs> I mean, that wouldn't be very nice of me as a pastor or, or a son of God. But if I did that, if I did that, how many times has she got to say, oh, well, praise the Lord, Thurman, I, I love you anyway. Yeah. Every time. Every time. Every time. Because now, if you do not, if you, do, if you take an offense, I mean, I don't care what anybody says to you, you know, if you take an offense that's going to slow you down in your walk with God because that, that's probably uh, the one that Lou come up with there, that unforgiveness. That's probably the heaviest weight. That thing is like having a, a 10,000 pound dragging behind us, weight dragging behind us with a big set of chains trying to, we're trying to trudge through the day with a big giant weight on us that we're pulling through unforgiveness. And then of course, if you happen to be somebody that's really prone to unforgiveness, well, not only do you hold a grudge against Thurman when he said you don't look nice today, 
but the next person, you know, says something and I'm, you're, you got a grudge against me, or I think, well, I don't like the way you look today either. So, you know, I'm, how dare her? You know? And so first thing you know, I got five or six unforgiveness or, or five or six grudges against people or, you know, people have offended me and I'm walking in these offenses. And of course, the, my power is totally cut off with God. I mean, he's off out yonder going somewhere 90 miles an hour. And I'm back here trying to, I got this chain over my shoulder, trying to drag this giant weight behind me. And I'm, I'm just moving like a snail. And it's slowing me down, isn't it? So think of the people in church today. That God tells us, <clears throat> whatever you do, don't get into an offense with nobody. Because it will cut your power off with me. It will stop your answers to prayer. And... You're having a great day today. <clears throat> you wake up this morning, you say, wow, look at that beautiful day out there. And somebody calls you and says something that you don't like, and you are on to oblivion. I mean, you know, you're mad at the world all of a sudden. How dare him call me and tell me that? Yet you were having a good day five minutes ago. Well, let me tell you what. As sons of God, when that person calls you and tells you something that's going to make you take an offense, you have the power within you to say, no, I ain't going there. Right. I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to love you anyway. Amen. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And when you do, then you don't let that offense get a hold of you. So you have stripped yourself of this offense because that offense, that unforgiveness is going to slow you down. And of course, <clears throat> when you really read the scriptures in detail, you find out not only is it going to bring a heavy weight to you, but it's going to bring one to your mate to your children, and to your financial world. And so you want to work hard to make millions, and you're building a big oil empire, and you're doing all these things, and all of a sudden you start getting into a fence with some of the business people, and all of a sudden everything in your empire, your wife starts getting sick, you start getting sick, your children get sick, and you're getting bankrupt, and all of a sudden all your equipment's breaking down and everything, and man, you talk about a oh, weight, you got one. Isn't that terrible? And it all happened because you took an offense. Isn't that something? So that's why the Lord tells us right here. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. You know, every time I think about stripping off a weight that slows me down, I think about when I reach down and pick up, if I pick up a 100-pound sack of cement, a 100-pound sack, and I carry it from the back of my pickup over to the mixer, a hundred pounds of heavy, Lou, you know that? It's really heavy. So I now can understand why they make them in 40 and 50 pound bags, can't you? <laughs> but let me tell you what, when I put one of them 50 pound bags on me and carry it, for, I don't have to carry very many of those till I'm wore out. Is that right? Now what if I had to carry that thing all day, every day? Boy, you talk about by the end of the day, you, I mean, I saw my son the other day pick up two 50 pound bags and he is a war horse. You know, and he picked up two 50-pound bags, and he carried them all the way around to the back of the house. But when he got back, he said, boy, I won't do that again. <laughs> I thought he was, t he thought he was tougher than he was, you see. But he found out when he carried them two 50-pound bags, he, they was heavy. And so, I mean, next time he's going to pull the car around there closer and unload them one at a time, you know. So I thought, hey, that's, that's smart. So, but is that what God's trying to tell us to do right here with these weights? All of these things that are creating a problem with us, and there's so many people, and this is what just really blows me away about human beings, especially Christians. If you don't know Jesus, it's kind of hard to teach you how to strip yourself off of these weights. But if you're a Christian, you have to realize that God gave me the power to do anything I want to do. I can do anything because I'm a son of God. You know, in other words, I have the power to say, uh, Kim, I don't like your dress today. And you have the power to say, well, pastor, I just love you anyway. Is that right? That's right. And we're going to have a great day. And I want to tell you how much I love you to shake and thank you for telling me you don't like me, but I just love you anyway. Amen. Is that the way we do it, Scott? When, when we walk in that kind of love, then you don't ever have one of those heavy weights dragging on. So when I walk off, you had a chance to take an offense, but you ain't going there. No, I'm going to love Pastor anyway. I don't care what he thinks about my dress, you know. So, but if I'm any kind of a pastor, I'm going to tell you I think you look lovely. You know, that's what I should say, right? 
I shouldn't. If, I, if you do come in and I don't think you look nice, and of course, you know, I know beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, I might dress like this one day and somebody said, man, I love purple and I think he looks so nice. And the next thing I'm going to say, man, he looks terrible in that outfit. Well, you know, I have the choice to either be offended by one or both of them or neither one of them. You know, if I don't want to be offended, Jackie, I have the power within me not to take an offense, don't I? You know, I, I do not have to do that. But the church today, if you say something to somebody in the church, you better be careful what you say because they're going to come back and say, I don't like the way you do this or I don't like the way you do that. I said, well, okay, praise God. You know, that's okay. I don't like the way you wear your hair. I said, well, that's okay. Praise God. Thank God I got hair, you know, so if you don't like the way I wear it, I, okay, I'm, I don't care, you know, but I, I ain't going to let you ruin my day. You see what I mean, Betty? I ain't letting nobody ruin my day. I, I mean, I comb my hair the way I want to comb it. And, and Cheryl, I, I re-comb it several times to please her. But I don't, I don't comb it to please nobody else. If she says, I don't like the way you combed your hair there, you need to take a fine tooth comb and go over it once more. You'd get rid of that rooster tail. I said, okay, honey, I'll do it. But I really could care less. You know, it's okay to me. And she knows that. But if she wants me to change it, I'll change it for her. Huh? Do what, honey? It's for the TV. It's for the TV, huh? Oh, oh, that's what she says. You got to look good for the TV. Who cares about the TV? I'm just trying to get a message across. I don't care what I look like. No, I don't care at all. I mean, you know, that's just me. And somebody's, I, I've had several people, especially women, that'll tell me when I go somewhere, they'll say, well, I watch you on GLC, and I'll say one thing. I'd like to meet your wife because I know you, you must have a good woman behind you. I said, why is that? And they said, because no man dresses as sharp as you do without a good woman behind him. <laughs> I say, okay, I do have one. I will have to say that. When I'm on TV, she's always out there, you know, and she's always dressing me and matching my suits and ties and all this stuff. And so, yes, you're right. I have a good woman behind me. She tells me how to dress. But, you know, I just, I just dress whatever she tells me. I don't take any offenses in what she tells me to wear. I just do what she says. You know, and that's, that works real well, right? <laughs> she has the mind of Christ. But now then, these heavy weights that are dragging us down. I mean, how many men and women, do, think about mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws and everything. And mother-in-law comes over one day and tells them, you know, you're not doing your child right here. You know, but, but mom, you know, I'm doing the best I can. Well, listen to me. I've already raised all of you kids. So, you know, you listen to me and I think you ought to do it this way. Well, <laughs> if you do that very many times, your daughter-in-law is not going to invite you back over very often because she don't want to hear that. She wants to raise her own children. I remember one time when Betty and Amanda were having a little discussion like this, and uh, Betty was trying to tell Amanda uh, something, and she's, uh, and actually, no, it was, I'll take it back. Amanda was trying to tell Mama. She said, now, Mama, I'm going out and leave my baby with you. Now, this is what I want you to do. And so mom's sitting there listening to this, and finally she says, now mom, be sure and do it like this. And she said, well, honey, I raised you and Tim. Don't you think I know how to raise a child? But, you know, she hadn't thought about that. You know, Amanda hadn't thought about that. Mom, I mean, mom, this is my child, my daughter, and you don't know how to raise my baby. And so, <clears throat> but, you know, they both had a good chance there to take an offense, but didn't either one of them take one. You know, they just went on about their way. But how many times do we know that these kind of things happen between Christians. What really gets me is between a husband and a wife. When a husband and wife stands here before me and Cheryl, when I say, how are y'all getting along? I, first of all, how long have you been married? You're sick or afflicted or whatever. The kids are, is all messed up and everything else. And I say, well, how long have you been married? Five years, 10 years, 30 years, whatever. I say, how are y'all getting along? We're not. I say, you want, you want to know what? I thought you both told me you were Christians. Well, we are. Well, I said, if you're Christians, then get along. Is that right? Do I have the privilege every day to be nice and sweet to this girl? I have to make that decision every day of my life. When I wake up in the morning, I'm going to tell her I love her. How beautiful she is. Everything about it. You know, or I could get up and say, I don't like you today. I don't think that, I don't like that dress. You know, you weren't, your lipstick's all smeared today, honey. I don't, what's wrong with you? Do I have the right to say those kind of things every day? Yeah. Now I can make my day miserable or I can make my life happy, right? Whose choice is it? Mine. It's yours. 
You see what I mean? Can we as Christians have a good day every day? Amen. You know, I, I tried once. I, I told Cheryl I was going to do this. And I think it, I think it was, we hadn't been married long when I told her, I said, you know, I mean, I know offenses come. I know they come. It's impossible, but they come. Because that's what the scripture says. But I said one thing about it. I, I'm, I think I figured out how to never receive an offense again. She said, how's that? I said, never expect anything from anybody. I found out I couldn't do that. I found out I couldn't do that. I expect things from people. You know what I mean? You know? And so I thought about yesterday. You know, yesterday we had a great day. We had 130 people here, something like this. And I mean, at the intermission, people were taking CDs and everything's like crazy. And not really that I was expecting it, but since Charlie started working for me and doing all this, I didn't even have to ask him. I didn't. Yesterday, he just in there getting CDs and just started filling up the things. And I thought, wow, look at that. Look at that guy. He is filling up all my stuff. He's keeping, keeping everything full. I, I, I didn't even have to tell him nothing. Huh? And not getting paid for it. Oh, and, and he, oh, I didn't even know that. He's not getting paid for it either. Wow, what a deal, you know? So you, you see what I mean? You know, I mean, I was, I was impressed with him just taking his little cart and going around here and keeping all these things full. Because people was taking stuff like crazy yesterday. I mean, 130 people, they took thousands of CDs and DVDs. But he kept it full, you know. And so I just praise the Lord that, you know, now then, now then that he's done that, see, from now on I'll expect that, see. You know, <laughs> you, you see where I'm coming from? But if he doesn't do it one day, what do I need to not do? Don't take an offense, right? Because I mean, he might not feel good that day or something. He might not want to do it. So I say, okay. But you see where, you see where, where I'm coming from. It's so easy to start seeing people do things and you expect them to do that for you all the time. And it, when they don't do it, don't take an offense because if you do, it's going to be a weight that you're going to hook on to and it's going to slow you down in your walk with God. I don't want to be slowed down in my walk with God. Do you? No. He says, strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. And you know, I think that, that when Lou said that a while ago about unforgiveness or taking an offense, I believe that's one of the biggest ones that slows us down in the church. Don't you, Lou? I mean, it's so easy to take an offense. I mean, but what really gets me is when people tell me, well, I haven't seen my son in 10 years because I got mad at him 10 years ago. I hadn't wrote him a letter or nothing. I thought, you idiot. You have a child. Well, <clears throat> but my child did things I don't like. Hey, who is the child here? Are you the, a child or are you the adult? If you're an adult Christian, I don't care what one of your children do to you, you should be able to walk up to them and forgive them and love them. Amen. I don't care what they do to you. If you cannot do that, you ain't much of a Christian. You know, if you as an adult, if you got children, I don't care how old your children may be or whatever, but if you, one of them offends you, if you can't be a big enough man, if you're a son of God or a daughter of God, you can't just walk up to one of your children, put your arm around them, shake their hand, walk in love, say, I love you, I love you. You know, let's go out to dinner tonight. I just love you. But dad, I don't like what you did. I don't care, son, whether you like that or not. I love you anyway. But some parents will take, okay, if you don't want to talk to me, forget it. Don't come see me no more. I have heard men and women that profess to be Christians do that to their own children. Don't come see me until you change. Have you heard that too? And they're supposed to be Christians. Wow. I just can't, I can't imagine us doing that. But that's one of the worst sins there. It slows us down. And especially that sin that so easily hinders our progress. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let me tell you, I, I think about running this race. I know the other day, Tim and Mac, they run together. Tim has been working with Mac now for a long time. When Tim started working with Mac, Mac weighed 534 pounds. That's a big boy. You know that? 534 pounds. Mac weighs now about 250. 
in two years, he's come from 534 to about 250. So him and Tim were going to run the other day, and they, the first three miles, Mac was going to run the three miles, and then they had left a car over there. And so they ran, and as they're running, of course, Mac is getting tired at three miles, 250 pounds. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't weigh 250 pounds, and I couldn't run three miles. You know, not without a break or two, I'll tell you for sure. But anyway, he's in pretty good shape. And as they're running, Tim's getting there. As they get close to the car, he said, Mac, he said, I'm going to run up there one more mile. I'll run four miles. And you, you bring the car up there and pick me up. And so Tim thought Mac hurt him. But you know, whenever a boy is running at the end of three miles and he weighs 250 pounds, he may be a little bit hard of hearing. He may be a little bit tired. Things may not be working like they're supposed to be. And so Tim assumed he heard him. Well, he gets all the way up there to four miles, and then he thinks, well, okay, so Mac's not here yet, so I'll go ahead and do these leg squats. So he does, a, I couldn't even go down and do that. But Tim <laughs> goes down and throws one leg out like this, and then he comes up and throws the other one out and goes all the way down and back up. He does 400 of those. <laughs> now then, you think your boy ain't in good shape? Now, I'd hate to think I'd have to have to get out here and throw one leg up and go all the way down like this. I've got to have both legs to do this. Go down and back up. Oh, God, that's great. I've got to have push up on the knee. I ain't near as good a shape as my son, I'll tell you for sure. But he done 400 of those, and then he realized that Mac must have misunderstood him because he still ain't there. So now he's totally wore out. So now he's got to run that two miles back to where the car is. So now when he gets back, he's done 400 leg squats and six miles of running. So when Tim got back, he was pretty tired. You see? Now then, do you think he could run that race a little quicker and faster than I could? Because yeah. he has relieved himself of all those weights, hasn't he? I'd hate to think. I, just like y'all just saw me, I couldn't throw that leg out and go down with this one one time here without some help. I, I couldn't do that. But to think that Tim can do that 400 times. He does them in batches of 100. You know, that's how good a shape that kid's in. You know, so if I wanted somebody out of this place to run me a four-mile race, I would pick him before I'd pick anybody in this place. Y'all know that? <laughs> Because I got a feeling he would outrun every one of us. I know I ain't, even no, I ain't even close to what he can do. Not even close, but he constantly works out. Now, like Bill said a while ago, if we constantly read and study this book, then we got this power within us that we know what to do from God. And that's the only way you can get it, isn't it, Bill? Read it and study it every day. You have to, that's exactly what the book says, and God knows best. Now let's go to verse uh, 2 and 3. See, we do, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Just like we just said. How do you keep your eyes on Jesus? You get in the book and read the Word. Because the Word of God is Jesus. Is that right? Amen. That's exactly. That's how you learn about Jesus. You get in the book uh, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. In other words, when you start out with Jesus... You can finish with Jesus. If you don't start with Jesus, you can't finish. You ain't going to finish this race. You know, the other night I was listening to Joni on TV, and she had a guy on there. This guy had go gone through his life without knowing Jesus, and then he died. And he went to the, and still, years later, when this guy, let's see, I forgot what his name was, Storm or something like that, Storm something, but this guy was on Joni on uh, Daystar the other night. And he, years later, after he had this experience, he still could hardly talk about this experience of going to hell. He got to go to hell. And he didn't know where he was or what he was doing, but he said it was the most awful thing. He said, by the time I got, he said, these things in this hospital when I died, he said, I, I, I looked, I, all of a sudden I'm standing beside the bed and there's my body. And I'm standing up here. And said, there ain't no pain or nothing. And said, I they told me I had to have surgery or I was going to die. But he said, I was, I forget now where he was. He was in England, I think, where they have uh, socialistic medicine. And they told him when the doctors examined him, you have a rupture of some kind, whatever it was, in his intestine. And you have to have surgery immediately or you're going to die. And so they run him in a... A, a, a ambulance or whatever, 
over to the hospital where they'd done the surgery, and it was on Saturday, and everybody's off on Saturday in socialistic medicine, so there wasn't nobody to do the surgery. Tony said, so, and you want socialistic medicine? And you want socialistic medicine? I don't think so. And so the guy lay there for 10 hours and then died because there was nobody to do the surgery. And so when he died, he's, he's up, off there, and all of a sudden his pain's all gone, and he's looking down at his body, and he, these beings are out in the hall saying, come on with us. Come on. He said, I thought it was the people wanted to take me and do surgery on me. I didn't realize it was demons. But he said, I went out there and said they was all covered up with their hoods and stuff. And so when they said, come on, come with us, he said, I followed them. And he said, we got into darker and darker and darker. And then I realized I didn't want to be where I was, but I could not go back. They would not let me. And he said, the further we got, the darker we got. He said, the things they did to my body, my spiritual body, because he left his flesh up there. He said, I can't tell you on this set what they did to me. But he said, you can think of the most wicked, awful things anybody could do to your body. He said, multiply it a hundred times. That's what they was doing to me. And he went all the way into hell. And then he said, I heard a voice. It says, pray to the Lord. He said, I didn't know how to pray. I had not spent enough time as a businessman. I was busy. I was busy making millions. I didn't know how to pray. And he said, the voice kept saying, pray to God. So finally he said, I remember something a Sunday school teacher told me years ago when I was a little boy. And I prayed that little simple prayer. And he said, the next thing I knew, I was back up in that room. I went back in my body and I was alive again. He said, Jesus Christ saved my life. I called on him. I was already in hell, and I called upon him, and he saved me. I'm telling you, boy, this is an awesome story. I mean, I listened to that the other night on Daystar. Oh, what's his name? Howard Storm. Howard Storm. That's it. That's what, that was his name. Yeah, Howard Storm. That's right. Howard Storm. Oh, you already looked it up, huh? Yeah. But isn't that something? See, now, God is no respecter of persons. This guy, he didn't know how to take off these weights. He didn't know how to run the race. He didn't know how to start from start to finish with Jesus until he was running his life, running his race through life without Jesus. And then when he came to that point where that rupture in his stomach or whatever it was, and he died, and then, of course, goes to that wonderful hospital, you know, where there's no doctors. You've got to have immediate surgery or you're going to die. And he lays there 10 hours and no doctors. And they ain't going to come in until Monday because they're socialistic medicine. Boy. I'm glad, I'm glad I got a Jesus that, I'm glad I got a Jesus, aren't you? Wow. He says, he was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Now he is seated in the place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. Of course, this is something. In Revelation 3, I think it's verse 20. No, verse 21. Verse 21, Revelation 3, 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I sat down with my father in his throne. Now, Jesus was an overcomer. He was a man. He came here and lived for 33 years, and he was an overcomer. And he showed us how to be an overcomer. And because he did do and accomplish what the father wanted him to do, what was his place of final resting? It was at the throne of God, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Wow. Jesus gets to sit at the right hand of God the Father. And then think about this. He says, if you will be an overcomer on earth, if you'll do what I tell you, and you'll walk in obedience to my word, as the Father let me sit with him in his throne... I will let you sit with me in my throne. Now, you know what? If there's not anything else that will drive you, that ought to drive you. I mean, 
to think, Bill, we only got a few years on this earth. Maybe 80, 90, or 100, 120. Uh, all of those at best, when you get mine and your age, we know even if we live 100, we ain't got many left. Right? And just think, what if we spend all of our efforts and time trying to make a few lousy stinking dollars down here, and then when you die, you leave them all here. But if you've spent all your time and your effort putting God first, obeying the king, when you die and go to heaven, he's going to welcome you and say, well done, son, come in. I have reserved this seat right here for you. Wow. Is that worth fighting for? Is that worth fighting for? Is that worth dying for? Oh, yeah. I mean, when I look at that, man, there ain't, I mean, I, that's why I do what I do for the kingdom of God day and night. I'm going to walk in love with everybody. I don't want no ways to slow me down. I mean, I want to be on fire for Jesus. I don't care whether they like it or don't like it. I don't make no difference to me. I'm going to just love them. I mean, if they tell me I'm crazy, that's okay. You know, I know I'm not crazy. I know what the Word of God says. I've read it. I've seen God do the wonderful thing. And I will have to say, that guy that was standing here yesterday, that his daughter said that those people from Ramah said I was crazy. He said, Thurman, I know you ain't crazy. My daughter, she said, I know you're not crazy. He said, the main reason I know you're not crazy is because when I started listening to you, I thought you were crazy too. And he said, when I, but I went home and got my Bible. And I said, my goodness, what he's saying is what my Bible says. So he said, I knew you wasn't crazy. And so he said, he said, I have run into somebody once in a while that'll say, you know, in 1963, I heard of a miracle that God did. Or 1975, I seen God do a miracle. He said, I get your tapes every month. He said, you got new testimonies every month. He said, I ain't never seen a man that's got testimonies like you got every month. He said, everybody in your ministry has testimonies. I said, so what does that tell you? We must be teaching what God says. If you teach what God says, Michael, you get a miracle from God, right? Amen. See, it don't just happen for Thurman. I mean, Michael, you know, I can tell you that when him and his wife, when he was doing the bathroom that time, and he was, he'd just been to our church a short period of time, he didn't know how to walk in this kind of faith. So, I mean, man, he's knocked out. I mean, his back's killing him. And he finally tells Grace, he says, I can't go no more. And, you know, she says, you know, Thurman says that the Bible says that two of us on earth agree about anything, and he'll do it. Let's do it. And he said, we did. And the minute we thanked God, he said, my pain went away and I was instantly totally healed. Michael's never going to be the same. You know that? Amen. The word of God didn't work just for Thurman. It worked for Michael. And since then, Michael's prayed for a lot of things and seen lots of answers, hadn't he? Yeah, see? So when you learn how this works, you'll throw off all that junk of the world. You'll start running the race from Jesus from start to finish. Right, Lou? You'll walk in obedience to his word because when we get home, and we're all going to get there someday. I don't care how many of us in here, <clears throat> every one of us have an appointment with destiny someday, don't we? We're all going to die. I, I, I couldn't even, I had to sit down a while ago when Cheryl read that thing about that guy. I just had to sit down. I couldn't sing or nothing. I'm thinking about, it's, it's so well with my soul. I, I know Jesus is in control. I mean, I had an experience almost like that guy did. You know, I almost been through the same thing. He lost all of his daughters at one time. I lost almost all of my female family at the same time. I had that fight to fight, and I thought, as I, God did mine different. He only took two of my girls and then left me two to get well. And I fought the fight of faith. And that man yesterday that was standing right here, he said, I have listened to that CD on my tractor as I drive. I know I've listened to that CD 10 times. And he said, every time I listen to it, I cry all the way through it because of your faith. He said, I've never seen a man that walks where you walk. Right. Well, what a shame. We ought to all be walking where I'm walking. Amen. You know, I'm not something special. I'm just a man that believes what it is written. Amen. Is that right? Amen. And when you believe it's written, yep. he does the same thing for you, doesn't he? Yep. Isn't that amazing? You know, I, can, I just shared with this couple over here. I love both of them with all my heart. When their son went to Afghanistan, we prayed for that boy. Didn't we? Yeah, we prayed that boy gets back safe, and he's been over twice, and he's back now, right? I mean, prayer changes things, doesn't it? Yes, we walk in obedience to God's Word. I mean, I wouldn't think about not praying for somebody, especially if I had a son going to Afghanistan. You know, I would be praying because I know what happens when you pray. You know, I see it all the time. I pray for people all the time and see God do awesome things. But just look at that. To him that overcomes. He didn't put your name in there, did he? 
He says, to him or her that overcomes will I grant to set with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame and I am set down with my father in his throne. That's what's available. And most people in the church don't even know that's written. They've never read it. So they're not driven to serve Jesus. If, if God's lucky, they go to church on Christmas and Easter. So many people that call themselves Christians, they don't, they don't go into God's house on a regular basis. They're not really serving God. But boy, when you really serve Him and put Him first, He will bless everything you put your hands to. Won't He, Richard? Yes, He's an awesome God. Okay, let's go to verse, uh, uh, go back to Hebrews 12, 3 and 4. Hebrews 12, 3 and 4. Think about all the endured, all he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him so that you don't become weary and give up. <clears throat> I think every time I read that, I think about this girl that I'd led to Jesus. She was a Catholic girl. I led her to Jesus, and then she had two bad knees, and I, she was in my office one day, and, and I prayed for her, and the Lord healed both of her knees and everything, and it just totally lit her fire for Jesus. Now she's come from a dead Catholic to an own fire or something. I don't know, I think non-denominational or whatever she was. But she was on fire for Jesus because the Lord had healed both of her knees. I took away all her pain and saved her and everything else. And then, of course, she has a husband that's a Southern Baptist, that's a CEO for McDonald's. You know, he was a big boy. You know, he was into big chips and everything else. And she's trying to tell him, honey, let's go to church. Why? Well, he said, I go to church when I have time. No, honey, I mean, God, he's much more than what you know. Oh, yeah, sure, woman, you know, I mean, you know, shut up, don't tell me this stuff. But I met a man, you know, that prayed for me. God, he, oh, yeah, you just think that was a figment of your imagination. No, she said, I really got here. Look at me, I can jump and dance. I got saved. You don't believe her. So anyway, you know, one day she was trying her best to get through to him. She's constantly talking to him about Jesus. So one day they go out to the chicken place to eat, and while they're in there, it comes a storm. And so they come out to the door and open the door and look out, and their car's right under, and he's just pouring down rain. He says, okay, this God that you serve, if he's so awesome and answers prayer, Let's see him stop the rain so we can get to the car. <laughs> Thank God for women of faith, Betty. <laughs> she says, Lord, you know how stiff-necked my husband is. <laughs> you know, he, he don't want to believe nothing, but Lord, you know I believe you. And so for me, Lord, I'm asking you by faith in your word. You did say I could ask for anything. So Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to stop the rain till we get to the car. Thank you, Lord. And it rained as well. Stop. So he walked out in there and he says, she said, well, come on, let's get to the car, you know. And so they get out to the car and he sits down in the car and pulls the door shut and whoosh. And so what a coincidence, you know. Okay, okay. So we get to the house and then he gets to the house and of course the, the garage is full of junk so he's got to park out front. And they park out in the front yard and he says, okay. Let's see him do it again. <laughs> so she said, Lord, you know, thank you for being so merciful. But Lord, I'm, my husband is so hard-headed when it comes to things like this. So uh, he says he's a Baptist, but Lord, I don't think he's really ever really met you. But Lord, I'm asking you to be merciful to me one more time and stop the rain so my husband and I can get to the house. She said, thank you, Lord. And it stopped. So he open, gets out, opens the door, and he shuts the door, and he looks around, and she said, well, come on, honey, let's get up. So she runs up, gets under the porch. He said, ain't no use to be in no hurry. It ain't raining. So he gets up there, and she said, but, you know, you asked me to stop it till we could get to the front porch. So he walks under the porch, and as soon as he does, turns around, whoosh, it comes down like this. And then he sits there a minute and watches it rain like crazy, and then he says, okay, woman, I'm impressed. <laughs> 
so the guy gets saved. He gets, why, why do you think God does those kind of things for his little ladies? He knows how hard-headed some of us guys are, doesn't he, Charlie? He knows how hard-headed we are. And so, anyway, he gets saved, and he starts going to church where there's some, but he's still not really done what he should be doing. You know, you know he's not been in the Word, and so he's given her a little hard time and everything, and and, and she's trying, you know, she's trying to push too hard, I think, about getting him to go to church with her and everything else. And he goes sometimes now, but sometimes he gets vocal with her, you know. No, woman, I got things to do today. I'm running a company, and I ain't got time to go to church. If you want to go to church, you go by yourself. I mean, you know, man shouldn't talk to his wife like that, but he, and so it offends her. It hurts her. So she come out to my house one day. She drove out there. She pulled up in my front yard, got out and walked in the kitchen, and Betty and I was both in there, was fixing to have something to eat, I think, or something. But anyway, this lady walked in, and she's crying, and she said, Thurman, my husband is so abusive to me, you got to do something. And she's just crying her heart out. I listened to her a few minutes, and she was just crying and crying and crying. And I says, well, woman, I said, you know, if he's that abusive, I want you to take your blouse off. I want to see your back. She said, What? I said, well, you know, I mean, you're crying and screaming like you've been beat with a cat of nine tails. I said, so I want to see your scars. I want to see your blood. And, oh, she said, he hadn't hit me. I said, then what's wrong with you? I said, why don't we just pray? I said, you know, you have, you've completely forgotten what the Savior had done for us. I said, here, the Savior went to the cross. He was beaten with a cat of nine tails. I mean, he was nailed on a cross. He never even opened his mouth. I said, surely you can take a little mental abuse. You don't have to have physical abuse, and he's not even hit you. So that's not a big deal, right? I said, so woman, get over it. Get over it. I said, we'll go to the throne of grace, and we'll pray for that guy. I said, we can go to the throne of grace. That's the way we get it done. So I said, but you have to remember what Jesus did for us. But you know, we want to take one little bitty tiny something and we want to take an offense and we get all upset at everybody. And then that slows us down, drags us down. So I went to the throne of grace, rebuked the devils of hell, asked the Lord to convict her husband of sin, bring him in, really into the kingdom of God, gloriously do a work with him and everything else. I said, now then go home and all the way home you praise the Lord and thank him. You have a husband that's on fire for Jesus. And next time I saw her, her and her husband were both on fire for Jesus. They had started their own business together. They were going to church every Sunday, and she was so happy with her husband, she could hardly stand it. But so the thing about it is, you look at what he says. Think about all he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him. I mean, have, when's the last time? Have, I don't Let me take my coat off and let you see my scars. I ain't got any scars. Have you, Scott? No, I ain't never been beaten with a cat of nine tails. Have you? No. So why should I grumble and complain, right? Yeah, I mean, Paul, he was beaten, he was bruised, he was shipwrecked, he was stoned and left for dead and everything else, right? I mean, if anybody had a reason to complain, it would have been Paul, wouldn't it? But he didn't even complain. So I, I think, wow, we are a bunch of whimps. So you don't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Obviously, I have not given my life in my struggle against sin because I'm still standing here, right? And obviously, each one of you have not been beaten to that point. You know, in fact, I'm going to tell you, probably, I don't know. Uh, if, if you've ever had a cat of nine tails hit across your back one time, would you hold your hand up? Nobody, nobody's ever been hit with a cat of nine tails, not one time. Well, I'm grateful, aren't you? I don't want to be, but thank Jesus, they beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him. And if you've seen the passion, how many of y'all seen the passion? Wow, wasn't that awful? I mean, that was awful, what they did to Jesus in that, in that movie. And it, it was awful. But now, Cheryl and I was watching the behind the scenes of that one night that they made, and the guy that was writing that said that shield they had on his body, they thought, the guy thought they had already put that on him, and the guy hit him with that, and the shield wasn't there. Boy, he said, you talk about hurt. That hurt. I bet he still got scars from that today. So, wow. Verse 5 and 6. And have you entirely forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you, his children? He said, my child, 
Don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you and don't be discouraged when he corrects you. What? What? Look at this. My child, don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you. Why? You think God would discipline us? Well, let's see what he says here. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. Oh. So if you ain't never had a discipline of no kind from God, guess what? You don't belong to him. You don't belong. That'd just be just like me. I used to discipline Tim and Amanda. But you know, I don't never discipline Scott's babies over here when they come to my house because they ain't mine. They're his. And he disciplines them. You see what I mean? That's his job. And however he does that, that ain't none of my business. You know, I don't tell Scott how to discipline his children. That's between him and God. Is that right? Amen. Yeah. I don't tell him. I mean, if he beat them every time he come out here, I say, hey, it's your kids, you know, praise God. You know. <laughs> but he don't have to beat them because they're good boys. You know, I think about, I woke up yesterday, I think it's yesterday morning, and I walked outside out here, and one of his boys was weed eating all around the church. I thought, man, look at that little guy go. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I saw you. Praise the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you for these good little guys. I mean, that weed eater's big as he is, you know. And he just walked a little bit short thing about this talk. Mm, boy, just cutting that grass like crazy. I thought, Lord, thank you for these sweet little guys. Yeah. You know, those guys work because they got a daddy that loves them that teaches them how to do things, that provides equipment for them to do things. Those boys will grow up to be workers, you know. They'll grow up to help dad, praise God. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes those he accepts as his children. Like I say, I mean, just like Dave. Dave, he don't spank his children very much anymore, but praise God, as they were coming up, he did. I have seen him spank his children. And usually it's after they needed it 30 minutes. You know, I mean, because Dave's just like me. He's loving, kind, and sweet, and he don't want to discipline his children until they drive him over the brink. And when they do, then he says, okay, that's it. Come, bam, you get us bored and give him a spanking or whatever he does. But, you know, let's look and see what it says about discipline. Verse uh, 7 and 8. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined? Unfortunately, today we have some of those. And those children that have never been disciplined, they di never learned how to respect authority. And sometimes it takes a man years to learn how to respect authority if he's not disciplined by his dad when he's a little boy. I mean, I remember when Tim was about 15 one day, I probably gave him four or five spankings in his whole life. They were all in his early years. After, it, he was a quick learner. You know, I mean, if you tell him not to do something, oh, he, don't, he goes and does it anyway. You know, well, then you get the board out and whop a couple of times. Well, three or four times that, he's, hey. Well, so he's about 15 one day. He said, Dad, I hadn't had a spanking in a long time. I said, you want one? He said, well, no. And I said, you know why you hadn't had one in a long time? He said, I guess because I've, and done everything you tell me to do. I said, hey, that's it, son. When your children obey you, you don't discipline them, do you? It's only when they disobey you. Well, do you think God disciplines us when we obey him? No, only when we disobey, right? So when we disobey, he's going to discipline you because you're his child and he loves you. So don't rebel when God disciplines you. Just say, Lord. what Dave said there a while ago, Lord, whatever I've done that doesn't please you, I repent. We've learned that well, haven't we, Dave? Yeah? So whenever something's going wrong, I mean, used to, we didn't have a clue. So, I mean, when bad things are happening, we think, well, that's just the way it happens. Now we've learned that's not the case. If we're being disciplined by God, you know, like that day that the gasoline got my eye out there, Dave was standing right beside me. You know, whenever I, I, <laughs> I got tickled at Dave, he said, you know what you did wrong, don't you? <laughs> I said, yes, I know exactly what I did wrong, and it was my grumbling and complaining. And God told me when I sent Dave to get the water to wash out my eye, the Lord told me, yes, you've been grumbling and complaining, and you should have been praising me and not grumbling and complaining, and that's why this happened to you. Woo. I said, okay, Lord. So guess what? I haven't grumbled and complained hardly any since then. I have learned my lesson the hard way. 
God put that gasoline in my eye. Let me tell you, that did hurt. So, and he told me, he said, you know, I'm tired of your grumbling and complaining. He said, that's why it happened to you. Well, it's kind of like today I was out grumbling lightly when we were putting the bathtub in the house. We took the windows out to put the bathtub in the house and we got, every, we got the windows all back in and I'm putting the last screw back in the window. And Dave's right there with me. And I'm leaning over on the drill, put the drill up there, and I said, if I only had a normal woman, my wife wants a bigger bathtub than a normal one. If I only had a normal woman, she'd use a normal bathtub, I wouldn't have to pull this one down. And I hit that drill and went forward, and that drill turned sideways, and that screw in my head hit that screw and ripped my eye open right there. Dave looked down, he said, you know what you did, don't you? <laughs> See, Dave's got really smart about this kind of stuff, see? But he didn't have to tell me. I knew also what I had done. Even though I was doing it in jest, did God tell me not to jest? Is that what he said? No jesting, no foolish talking. And I knew better, and I got my eye cut open right above, right there in the eyebrow. Just that screw hit me right there and just ripped it wide open. It bled like crazy. And, of course, I looked up at Dave, and he looked down. No compassion whatsoever. He said, you know what you did wrong, don't you? <laughs> he said, you got a spanking from God. I said, yes, I did. <laughs> we live and learn. And then I can tell you, hopefully you'll listen and you won't do the same dumb things I did. Isn't that something? Nine and ten. Oh, wait, I didn't finish number ten, did I? Let's go back there, yeah. God's discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you're Ill illegitimate and you're not really his children at all. Down verse 9 and 10. Since we respect our earthly fathers who disciplined us, should we not all the more cheerfully submit to the discipline of our heavenly father and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always right and good for us because it means we will share in his holiness. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I would like to share in God's holiness, wouldn't you? Amen. I want to walk in obedience to his word. Amen. I want to do what the king says because I want to be an obedient son so that when you come here for me to pray for you or whoever I want God to hear our prayers, whether it's me praying or Cheryl praying or Dave or Jeff or who, Rosemary, Sharon, whoever it is, I want God to hear our prayers. I want him to be happy with me. I, I'm a son of God, and I want to obey him because I want my heavenly father to be as happy with me as he was with Jesus because I know how happy I am when my son does good things. I like to brag on him, too. I love him with all my heart, and I, I know how it is with a dad. If you've got a son, you want him to be a good boy, and you want him to do wonderful things so you can tell everybody, you know, how you can brag on him, and your grandbabies, you know, and everything. Like I was telling somebody the other day, I wanted Tim to be an engineer, but he didn't want to be an engineer. He wanted to do something else. I said, well, God will give me an engineer sooner or later. Well, when they come back from the water park last week, they went over there. And Preston, he's eight years old, I guess. Preston come back and said, Granddad, I went down the slide 47 times. I said, you counted every time you went down the slide? He said, absolutely. I went down it 47 times. I said, praise God. Thank you for my little engineer. I know he's going to be an engineer. I know. Uh, God, go give me another one, you know. So he skipped one, and now he's bringing Tim's not a Tim never count nothing. When he said that, Tim said, you counted all that? He said, yes, Daddy. I said, son, he's going to be an engineer. I guarantee you. Anybody work with numbers like that? I got my engineer. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my baby. Wow. Father, we thank you and praise you for this beautiful day and what an awesome God you are. How you give us the desires of our heart if we'll just obey you. And Lord, we thank you for the discipline. You discipline us because I know when you do it, it's, it is painful. But Lord, when it's over, we share in your holiness. And I thank you and praise you for being that wonderful Father that disciplines us and makes us sons of God and uses us for your glory. And we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 